Okay, so in this second video of linear motion, we're going to cover linear kinematics, kinetics, and the impulse momentum relationship. So kinematics, as I mentioned earlier in my previous video, is the study of uh, the geometry of motion where we describe motion in both the spatial or direction and temporal dimensions, which is the, the time aspect of that, without regards to the forces and or torques that cause or change that motion. That's kinetics. We'll go over that in a few minutes here. So kinematic terms could include displacement, it includes velocity, acceleration. In fact, we're going to concentrate on those three kinematic terms first in, in describing human motion. So let's take a soccer pitch here. We got a guy who traveled from one end of the field to the other end of the field, and the length that he traveled in that path is simply known as distance. So we know that is a scalar quantity. It only has magnitude. There is no direction. However, the difference or the change in position from point A to point B is otherwise known as displacement. And that has obviously both magnitude and direction. And if we had a coordinate system attached to this soccer field, in this case a two-dimensional coordinate system, X and Y, we can then um, describe his motion in, at least in this case, it's displacement in both the x and y direction. And because it's a vector quantity, we can use the uh, trig functions that I showed you in my previous uh, video to decompose the components in the horizontal and vertical directions for his displacement. And now here, displacement, as I mentioned earlier, is the difference or the change in position, right? So, and more specifically, the final position minus the initial position. So if the person did this, ran this path and, you know, travel, I don't know, 100 yards to go from the starting position and end up in the same starting position, what do you think his displacement is? That's an easy one, right? You didn't, uh, if you busted out your calculators for this one, give me a call, shoot me an email, let's spark on that for a sec. <laughs> yeah, you're right, zero, because the starting and, uh, and, and final positions are exactly the same. So therefore, displacement is, is uh, zero in that case. Okay, so that same concept, we can now extend it to the change in position over time. We know that the rate at which uh, someone changes their position over time is known as speed, that's the magnitude. In terms of the vector equivalent to that, it's known as velocity, because that is a change in magnitude and or direction in terms of position over time. And we can describe velocity, again, if we have a coordinate system attached to this, this soccer field in both the x and y direction. Okay. Now, now take the change in velocity. If we looked at the change in velocity over time, okay, we know that as acceleration. And incidentally, acceleration is a term that's used to describe both the scalar quantity as well as the vector quantity of the change in speed over time or change in velocity over time, respectively. And that describes the change in magnitude or direction in velocity over time. So, you know, one, uh, I guess, perfect example in which an object could be moving at a constant speed and still be accelerating is when you someone's making a, a turn. Let's say they're running on a track and they're making a left turn at a constant speed because that person is changing directions constantly when they're turning. They're, uh, they're experiencing acceleration. In this case, it's called centripetal acceleration. You might have felt the effects of centripetal acceleration, which is acceleration towards the center uh, when you're making a left turn or making a right turn uh, when you're driving. So linear acceleration, remember, it's a change in magnitude and or direction of the velocity with respect to time as per given by this equation. And, and one of the things that often students have trouble in, uh, envisioning is the direction of acceleration. When you see someone moving or something moving, we automatically think the direction of, of motion. And really what you're looking at is the direction of velocity. When we're trying to figure out the direction of acceleration, you have to take in mind a couple of things. Number one, what's the direction of motion? And number two, whether or not they're, whether they're speeding up or slowing down or remaining at a constant velocity to determine the direction of acceleration. So I'm gonna use you know, a car as an example here. Let's say the first example a car is slowing down, is moving in the negative direction. Let's just assume the leftward direction is negative and the rightward direction is positive. Let's just call it the x-axis. So because the, person, the, the car is slowing down, but still moving in the negative direction, the direction of acceleration is positive. 
If the car, however, is moving in the negative direction at a constant speed, remember, same direction at a constant speed, acceleration is obviously, obviously zero. If the car in, um, speeds up in the negative direction, this car has obviously negative acceleration. So when you hear that term negative acceleration, it doesn't necessarily mean that the object is, is slowing down, right? It depends on the direction of velocity. In fact, let's skip a few of these and just go to the, the next one. Let's say, for example, a car is traveling in the positive direction and decides to slow down. The direction of acceleration would therefore be in the negative direction. So it's very important. We're going to get a, a few examples, a couple examples, mainly looking at the counter movement jump, so you can begin to understand, you know, positive and negative acceleration in terms of what the body is doing during the actual movement task. Now I'm going to bring in some forces. We're now going to look at those forces and torques that cause or change the motion. And this is a branch of biomechanics known as kinetics. As linear kinetics, we're just concentrating on translation of motion right now. Okay. Um, when we start talking about rotations and things like that, that's more on the angular kinetic side. So the sources of forces, as I mentioned in my previous video, can include friction, muscular forces, as well as the force of gravity. Okay, so now let's go back to our squad here. When the person's just standing there, the net force, which is the sum of the person's weight and the ground reaction force, remember equal and opposite, while the person is standing there, the net force is zero. The sum of the two is zero. So therefore, acceleration is also zero because why? Newton's second law says that acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. Now the person begins to do, we're looking at a counter movement jump here. The person is uh, in this position about to jump you know, you know, propel f uh, upward. And in this case, the ground reaction force is greater than the person's weight. So therefore, the net force is greater than zero. And, the, and subsequently, the acceleration is positive. Now, can't really tell just yet whether or not the person's slowing down while um, performing the, uh, the squat the, uh, phase of the counter movement jump, or is it accelerating upward? We have to look at a video for that, and that's separate. And so before we look at these examples of the counter movement jump, I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper what I mean by the net force. So the net force is sum of all the forces that are acting on the body. And in this example, we're only interested in the person's weight, and that's the force due to gravity, mass times the acceleration of gravity, which is 9.8, negative 9.81 meters per second squared, and Fz here, which is the ground reaction force. This right here is the sum of the force equals mass times acceleration. We all know that as Newton's second law, the law of acceleration. If we set this equation, the sum of the forces, ground reaction force, vertical ground reaction force, person's weight, equals mass times the acceleration in the vertical direction. We solve for the vertical acceleration. This is the equation that we use. Now, for now, we're not going to do any math on this, but I want to show this to you so you can begin to appreciate the effect, more specifically, of the ground reaction force has on the acceleration of a person performing a, a jump a counter movement jump. So we'll go this we'll go this step by step and then I'll show you an example that we did in our biomechanics lab um, as a, a, a direct application in analyzing a counter movement jump. So I have here Ashley, she's standing here at point A. At this point the ground reaction force, which is indicated by this green arrow here, is equal and opposite in direction to her weight, or more specifically, the force of gravity, which aka is her weight. You sum both of those up, you get a net force of zero. And therefore, the acceleration is zero. Um, ooh, let me back up. I apologize. I should have filled this to you earlier. This right here represents the ground reaction force, more specifically, the vertical ground reaction force during a counter movement jump. Okay, And then I'll show you how that looks in terms of the uh, vertical acceleration. Okay, so now the person begins the squat down during the, the counter movement jump. That's why it's called a counter movement jump. And notice here the ground reaction force actually decreases. And the person, in a way, is controlling their fall. And so therefore, the ground reaction force is actually less than the person's weight. So therefore, the net force in this case would uh, induce a negative acceleration. I'll show you that in a sec. Then the person slows down. 
as a person is approaching. Oops. Uh, yep, I think so. The person slows down as the person is approaching the the squatted or the end of the squat uh, position here. So from B to C as shown here. Notice you see uh, up up. You, well, I don't. You don't see acceleration, but what you do see is, is the ground reaction force, the vertical component of the ground reaction force, um, increasing above the person's weight. So therefore, you can just by looking at that by Newton's second law that the acceleration is also vertical. And there's a little bit of pause that the person transitions from that squatted position into the acceleration upward position, and that is indicated here by D. And so that is the ground reaction force. In fact, this person peaks at somewhere around 1300 newtons, which is enough to accelerate her center of gravity um, above 9.81 meters per second squared and allows her to take off. That in a nutshell is rocket science, right? It's based on Newton's uh, third law, which is the law of action reaction, that's the ground reaction force here, uh, and Newton's second law, which says that the acceleration of the a jumper in this case is directly proportional to the net effect of force imparted on the person's center of gravity, which is governed by the ground reaction force and her weight. Weight doesn't change, so it's all just her ground reaction force. And then Newton's first law, which is when, when the person is just on the uh, person just standing there, and the net force is equal to zero, so therefore there is no acceleration. So anyway, I, I give an example of this of how we um, uh, use all these principles in terms of ground reaction force and the vertical acceleration. Uh, looking at a counter movement jump in our biomechanics lab. So check this out. Okay, so if you viewed my previous video on this counter movement jump, I talked about Newton's uh, first, second, and third laws of motion in the context of the jump itself. So now I want to talk and focus on acceleration during the actual jump. So uh, according to Newton's second law, the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force imposed on um, the uh, center of gravity of the, in this case, the athlete, the jumper. So the top graph here represents the ground reaction force, the vertical ground reaction force, and the bottom graph here represents the acceleration of the center of gravity in the vertical direction. So you can see that the curves are exactly the same. The only difference is obviously the units and the scale, and that's because of Newton's second law, right? It's directly proportional. Now, I should uh, emphasize that when I say the net force, that means the sum of both the person's weight and the vertical ground reaction force. So the only thing that changes, obviously, is the vertical ground reaction force as the person you know, contracts uh, quadriceps, the hip extensors, uh, plantar flexors, all of those combine and, and, and makes contact with the ground and in reaction that is indicated by this GRF, the ground reaction force. So we can see here, this is jump itself, squat down, accelerates up, is in flight, and then he lands as such here. So let's talk about acceleration. So the first part, <clears throat> uh, the person is just simply standing there and so therefore the ground reaction force is equal and opposite to the person's weight. So you sum both of those up, you get zero and you can see here that the acceleration is roughly zero. It's pretty close to it. Then the person begins to accelerate downward and you could see that the vertical ground reaction force actually decreases uh, slightly there and the person is in a way is falling down he's controlling his fall but you could see that because he's speeding up towards the ground he's experienced negative acceleration right which makes sense he's going from a resting position into some negative velocity whatever that may be so he reaches a, a peak negative acceleration and at one point he slows down in fact, if you look at this graph right here, eventually the vertical acceleration is going to cross zero. And here, this is very important, here you see there's positive acceleration. Positive acceleration indicates that he is slowing down while still moving towards the ground here. And you can see that here, he's still moving. He's still going down on the squat, but he's slowing down as he's doing so. In the, in, if you know your anatomy, he is eccentrically contracting his muscles to slow his center of gravity towards the ground. And then he holds it, and look at the vertical ground reaction force. You can see how they're directly proportional. 
to the acceleration. That's the positive acceleration. He holds it for a few milliseconds and then positive acceleration now indicates now he is propelling himself upward. So in this part of the acceleration phase, or I'm sorry, the acceleration graph, this is eccentric loading, right? He's essentially loading, he's slowing down, holds it for a few milliseconds, and then here, this is the actual power. This is a concentric load where he is pushing off off the ground. The ground, in turns, by the ground reaction force, accelerates his center of gravity higher than 9.81 meters per second squared, which is the acceleration of gravity. It takes off because of that. While he's in flight, he's essentially a projectile, a projectile so therefore, he is governed by gravity at 9.81 meters per second squared. And then he lands. So he's landing at a certain vertical velocity, a certain negative vertical velocity. The ground obviously is stopping his fall. And while he's stopping, you can see that's illustrated in this first, it's called, we call this a transient word, an impact transient. And that is due to the sudden change in the downward momentum of the center of gravity. He then obviously activates those same muscles eccentrically to slow down the rate of downward uh, um, acceleration here. You can show here, here, positive acceleration, positive acceleration because he's moving in the negative direction, but he is slowing down. And then he gets back up. He's going back from the squatted position back to the standing position. Notice here, this is negative acceleration. Why? Because now he's his motion, his actual velocity is in the positive direction, but he is slowing down as he gets to the standing or resting position. So therefore, the, he has experienced negative acceleration. And then ultimately, he ends up at zero. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, demonstrate for you how Newton's second law, law of acceleration, can be rearranged to describe or show the impulse momentum relationship. So we're going to look at the impulse momentum relationship. So this is uh, Newton's second law, right? Law of acceleration. That acceleration is directly proportional to the force imparted on that object. I'm going to rearrange this. We also know that acceleration is the change in velocity over time, right? The, or the time rate of change in velocity. If I multiply both sides by time, I get force times time equals mass times the change in velocity. And this term right here, the product of force and the duration in which that force is applied is otherwise known as impulse. While well, this term, is otherwise known as momentum. So if you've heard the term before, uh, momentum, and momentum, specifically the change momentum is essentially a unit of, of, of velocity or a unit of inertia of a moving object. So every object, whether it's an athlete or you know a long jumper or a basketball player, whatever, has momentum because we all have mass. So whenever we're moving, we have uh, momentum, and whenever we accelerate, we're changing, uh, we're changing our velocity, and so therefore we're changing momentum. So this is a unit that I'm sure, or a term that I'm sure you've uh, ran into before in terms of momentum, and that is directly proportional to the impulse, which is the product of the force and the time of application of that force. So I go over a number of different examples of how impulse equates to a change in momentum uh, for an object. In fact, if you were to rewrite this, it would look like something like this, right? So whenever you, you land from a jump or if you, you know, run into a wall, hopefully you don't, um, you're changing your velocity, so therefore you're also changing your momentum. So really, when we're talking about objects in motion, we're really talking about the momentum of that object. And any changes of that is directly related to uh, what's happening in terms of the impulse. Okay. Good. So as I mentioned, the change in momentum is directly proportional to the impulse. Impulse, again, is the product of the force, the net effect of force, and the time of application of that force. And to visualize this, you can think of um, 
a, a number of different athletic activities, like a shot put or a javelin throw, uh, you know, baseball pitching here, for example. You know, in a separate lecture, I talk a lot about the kinetic chain and the energy energy through uh, the kinetic chain is the 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 six the system of linked segments through which mechanical energy flows up the chain here in a proximal to distal fashion in order to impart momentum on that ball. And so the longer that force is applied to the implement, this is in this case the baseball, the um, greater the change of momentum will be. And the, the whole goal of throwing a baseball for all you know, every pitcher is to throw, well, if they're throwing a fastball, to throw it as, as, you know, as fast as possible, you know, somewhere in the strike zone. So all of the individual segments that rotate and move throughout the kinetic chain equate to a buildup of impulse that translate to a change in momentum to throw the ball. So that's how the impulse momentum relationship is used to describe um, force being applied over a specific time to impart a change in momentum. Now we're going to uh, re rearrange, going to double rearrange, uh, the, the uh, impulse momentum relationship, or more specifically Newton's second law, back to its original form. So this is now, I multiply, or I'm sorry, divide both sides of the impulse momentum equation by time. So what I end up here is the didactic equation for Newton's second law of acceleration, which says here that the change in momentum over time is directly proportional to the force or the net effect of force. It's just a fancy way of saying that mass times acceleration, which is change in velocity over time, is equal to force. And the reason why I want to show this, I want to show you how Newton's second law can explain how cushioning works what we call impact attenuation. So I got a guy here who's doing a drop vertical jump. And those of you who work out and those of you who work with, with athletes, you know that to properly land from a jump, you ask them, okay, you need to finish the jump. You need to, 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 to flex your knees and, and contract your quadriceps and hip extensors and plantar flexors eccentrically in order to slow down that, that landing, right? Well, in terms of Newtonian mechanics, what that means, if we increase the time in which the change of momentum occurs, we subsequently decrease the force, right? That's an inverse relationship between force and time. This is a change of momentum. So if you've got two guys or, 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 or the same guy who's performing, you know, a, a drop vertical jump and wants to compare soft landing versus stiff landing, and soft landing, you tell them, okay, you need to finish the landing, bend your knees, et cetera, et cetera. Stiff landing, you turn them to land with their knees fully extended. Ugh. Yeah, I don't think you want to do that, right? That's going to hurt. But in both cases, if they're jumping off a box of the same height, the change of momentum is exactly the same. The only difference is the time in which that change of momentum occurs. So in the stiff landing, the time is, is minimized, is decreased. So therefore, the change of momentum divided by that time, the net force, impact force, will be significantly higher than it would be if they did a soft landing in which they, they increased the time in this case, in which the change of momentum occurs, um, because they increase it by, you know, bending their knees and, and keeping their hip flexor and hip uh, extensors uh, eccentrically contracted, along with their plantar flexors, they can. Sh and this is one example here. They can decrease the force, and you can show here. In fact, I've got examples in the lab where it's it's night and day, where the soft landing is significantly um, um, uh, less less than what the force is during stiff landing. And it's all related to the Newton's second law. You increase the time in which the change of momentum occurs, you decrease the overall impact force. That's how cushioning works in shoes. You know, if you're a runner, you, you look at shoes from, you know, a number of different characteristics, whether it's cushioning, um, you know, motion control or stability. And the cushioning part, they use softer materials in the midsoles in order to increase the time in which the, uh, the shoe and foot the, the whole complex contacts the ground. And you've got also some other instances. This is, a, you know, vibrance. This is those, uh, you know, for people who run barefoot. Now, this has no cushioning. However, most barefoot runners tend to run on their toes. And because they run on their toes, they tend to land in a plantar flex position. And so they go into dorsiflexions passively. And what controls that? 
plantar flexors. And so in a way that is a natural shock absorbing mechanism. You're increasing, or well not you or not me, I'm not a barefoot runner, but barefoot runners can increase the time in which impact occurs at the foot by eccentrically contracting those plantar flexors in order to quote unquote cushion or absorb shock. So that's how Newton's second law is used to describe shock absorption.